guys, this is Ms. Osborne with another WSQ video, the start of urbanization and urban reform we're looking at today. Um, immigrants are starting to come into the United States from the Eastern and Southern European countries, and they're affecting the way that America functions after the turn of the century. So as you watch the video, make sure that you're answering the guided questions that are provided. It's okay if you need to pause or rewatch the video in order to gu answer the guided questions. When the video ends, summarize the main points of the video in paragraph form using the specific vocabulary given to you on your WSQ sheet. Then I want you to finish by asking one question. This can be something you're confused about, a general question, or a discussion question to bring to class. The essential question that we're going to be answering in this video is how did industrialization encourage immigration, urban development, and ethnic diversity? Spartan historians will compare and contrast different pull and push factors that encouraged immigrants to come to America. There's two different types of immigrants. When we're talking about old immigrants and new immigrants, old immigrants were the first settlers to America. They arrived before 1800. When you think of this, I want you to think of colonists, right? And the colonists mainly come from northern and western Europe, but also China. Okay, The northern and western Europeans are going to be mainly the British, the French, um, from the Netherlands. These people were mainly coming because they want um, a voice in government. The Puritans came because they wanted to purify the Christian church. So they were seeking religious tolerance. But they also came for economic opportunity, right? Because most of the joint stock companies came to America because they thought they had the opportunity to earn more money. Most of the people that are coming to the United States during this time period are going to be Protestants. They're very, very culturally similar to the original um, American settlers, and they settle both in the cities along the eastern seaboard, but also pushing into rural areas farther west. The new immigrants are arriving between 1880 and 1910. They mainly are coming from southern and eastern Europe, so think Italy, Russia, those types of eastern European countries. They're mainly coming for economic opportunity. The new resurgence of industrialization during this time period is going to inspire a lot of people to come to work in factories in America. Some are also wanting religious tolerance. The Jews mainly are coming for religious tolerance. The main people are coming that are going to be Catholic Jews and Orthodox Christians. Again, these people are mainly settling um, in America from Italy and Russia, which is where a lot of the Catholics and Jews are coming from. They're very culturally different from American settlers. Most of the new immigrants are not going to speak English. They have their own cultural practices that are going to be very different from what the, was viewed as being an American. And most of these new immigrants are going to settle in cities, except the Germans who are settling farther west. Russian Jews are fleeing to the United States in search of religious freedom. There's a lot of um, anti-Semitism going on in Eastern Europe during this time period. There's also not very much economic opportunity in Southern and Eastern European, Europe at this point. The United States journey to the United States was really hard. The U.S. had an immigration law in place saying that the person who came to the United States had to have an ID or some sort of identifying information, $30 in cash to show that they could economically support themselves, and then they also had to indicate whether they'd ever been in prison, whether they'd ever been poor, or if they had ever been in some sort of mental institution. Before boarding a ship, the American immigrants had to pass a medical examination. The European immigrants coming to the United States came through Ellis Island in New York Harbor. Angel Island was used as the immigration station on the West Coast in San Francisco for mostly the Chinese and Japanese immigrants. The first step in becoming a United, coming to the United States as an immigrant was to have an ID, $30, and to indicate if you had been in a poorhouse, a prison, or a mental institution. Then you had to have a medical examination to show whether or not you were medically fit or if you had any sort of diseases, they would kick you out. Then you had to go through the immigration process, which was a lot of paperwork and could take hours. And then you were finally let into America. Now, once they got into America, the immigrants mainly are going to settle in neighborhoods with people of their same culture. Okay? And these became known as slums because most of the people who were coming to the United States were coming with very little money. They were coming for economic opportunity to work in the factories. Okay? And they built what they called benevolent societies that were formed in order to keep their cultural traditions alive. They wanted to help immigrants find new jobs because they had their same culture, so it was essentially like an opportunity for a neighbor to help a neighbor out, right? They also helped them with health care and education and also helped families that were um, hurt um, by somebody being hurt on the job because there was no sort of unemployment insurance during this time period. 
nativists hated immigrants, okay? Nativists are people who oppose immigrants. They blamed immigrants for crime, poverty, and violence. They said all the immigrants who were coming to the United States were poor, they were violent, they drank too much. They all believed that the immigrants were going to take jobs from those Americans that were already here. Nativists claim that because they can't adjust to American life, they're poor, they're illiterate, they're not Protestant, those immigrants are not going to be able to be American, what we call to be an American today. The nativists end up petitioning for a literacy test, trying to figure out if the test takers could read English by Congress in 1917. It's going to limit their opportunity to vote um, and other opportunities in society. Nativists in California mainly want to ban the Chinese and the Japanese. They wanted to ban them because they felt like there was too many people coming in. The Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 banned Chinese immigration for 10 years. And any Chinese, Chinese person who was already in America could not become a citizen. It was renewed in 1892, effectively banning Chinese immigration for 20 full years. American government also began segregating the Japanese children from white children. The Japanese and the American governments came together to create the Gentlemen's Agreement. Essentially, Japan said, hey, we'll send you only our skilled laborers if you stop desegregating our children when they come to the United States and giving them an opportunity to get an uh, equal education. Mass transit in the cities completely changed the way that the cities were made up. Previous to this, the cities had mainly been made up of rich people. But after mass transit and the automobile are um, created, the upper and middle class are, can start living outside of the cities and just commute to work, right? Because they could ride the subway in or ride in the automobiles. The poor can't afford an automobile and they couldn't afford the cost of a commute. And so they were the ones that had to live inside of the city. As cities start building up, though, there's more and more buildings and skyscrapers being built. And so people started getting scared that there was going to be no green space or no grass left in the cities. Central Park is a good example of an area that was kept in the city in order to prevent all the green spaces from being removed. Frederick Law Olmsted is one of the most famous designers. He was a uh, park architect designing green spaces um, in cities. He designed Central Park, but he also designed a couple different parks in Chicago as well. The richest Americans in the 1800s make their money in industry and business. Think of like the industrial tycoons we talked about, Rockefeller, Carnegie. And most of these people are new rich, right? So they're new into their money. And so they make a spectacle of their wealth. They show it off, just like in the castle picture below. That was one of the houses of an industrial tycoon in the late 1800s. So this time period becomes known as the Gilded Age, meaning that if something is gilded, it means that it's gold on the outside and good on the outside and shiny on the outside, but on the inside it's really rotten. And so a lot of people thought that industrial tycoons during this time period were really, really corrupt. Now, since there was a lot of um, money with the wealthy, the wealthy women were encouraged to be a homemaker. Their whole job was primarily just to organize, to decorate, to entertain, to oversee the servants in the household, but also to provide some moral and social guidance for her family. She really just stayed home and organized her family. The growth of an industry led to a large middle class. As industry in, uh, evolved and factories increased, they needed more managers and accountants and jobs like that that would help support the big businesses. Okay? And so those, that led to what we call white collar jobs. Some women are also able to work outside the home if they're in the middle class, but only single women. They might work as a secretary or something like that. But once they became married, they all had to become home worker, homemakers. If you worked outside of the home when you were married, it was kind of seen as embarrassing to your husband because he couldn't support you. And since the innovations and inventions are making life more efficient during this time period, there's a lot less time being spent on housework, which is going to give middle class women a lot more time for activities. They become activists for the women's rights movement um, or activists for in reforms and progressive reforms. And they're also going to join social clubs and do a lot of volunteering. The large number of immigrants, there's a ton of immigrants coming to the United States, help keep the wages low, right? When supply is high, the price is low. So when there's a lot of immigrants around, there's the prices of those immigrants or the wages that they're going to cost are going to be really low. Anytime that anybody would stop working, they would just have another one to pluck off to come and bring into the factory floor. 
okay? The working class, mainly these, um, the immigrants that were coming in, again, we talked about the slums before, they're going to move into what we call run-down apartments called tenements, right? And the picture on the right is looking at a dumbbell tenement because it's the shape of a dumbbell. If you can see, there's a public hall with just one bathroom where that X is. There's four bedrooms on either side. Each side is a house, right? So there's a bedroom, a bedroom, the living room, and the parlor on one side, and then the same thing on the other side. They're going to be really, really unsanitary. There's not a lot of um, ventilation. There's only one toilet per hall. Um, there's no running water. So a lot of times these tenements were really dangerous. Housekeeping is also going to be pretty laborious in tenements, meaning that it's going to take a lot of work in order to keep up. There's no running water. The women that are working uh, in uh, that live in the tenements often are also working jobs outside of the home, and so it makes it really hard for women to keep up with their daily household chores. Make sure that you answered the guided questions that are provided. If you needed to go back and watch the video again, I encourage you to do so. After you finish this video, make sure to summarize the main points in paragraph form using complete sentences. Make sure that you use the specific vocabulary that I gave you on your WSQ sheet. And then finish by asking one question, something you're still confused about based on the PowerPoint, um, a general question, or a discussion question to bring to class. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you in class.